appreciate you being here. All right, the young people can go to Children's Church this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter number 20. 2 Chronicles, chapter number 20. Sometimes the, uh, the genealogies of Chronicles can be overwhelming, but there is some good information packed in the book of Chronicles, 1 and 2 Chronicles, and 1 Kings, 2 Kings, what great books they are. So we want to look at uh, 2 Chronicles, chapter number 20. I'm going to start reading at verse number 12. I'm going to add just a few thoughts as I read this morning, and then we're going to jump into the Word of God. Uh, I'm going to challenge you as we are starting this new year, 2018, and that there are things that we need to do. We may find ourselves at a place where you may say, I've done all that I can do. What do we do? How do we respond? What's God up to in the of all this? Aren't you glad God's always up to something? Yeah, yeah He's always up to something. When you're, when you're in the middle of something, uh, if you could reframe your, your mind to look and say, God, what are you trying to do or show me through this? I do believe that God will be working and showing you something. Amen. I do believe that. Praise God. Praise God. The Bible says, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Amen. But our eyes are upon you. Don't leave yet. I wanted to say something here. Do you know that in every one of our situations, we have the same opportunity. We may look at situations, they may seem big, they may seem large, whatever is those needs in our life. But we have to realize that on our own merit and on our own strength, we are no one to fight the wiles of the enemy. We can't do it. The enemy is greater, he's stronger, he's wiser, he, he's been around, he's, he, he, he's wicked. There's nothing we can do to fight the enemy on our own. Amen. The word of God, and I'll make reference again in verse number 14. It's not by our might, it's not by our power. Amen. But it's by keeping our eyes upon Jesus and knowing that uh, 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 our strength is totally dependent upon the Lord. Do you hear me this morning? Our strength has to totally be dependent upon God in every situation. Amen. Every situation. God, you are my strength. You're the one that's fighting the battle for me. You're the one that is helping me. I cannot do this on my own. And so here they are. But we're finding that, uh, that the king is saying, Jehoshaphat, he says, we, we can't stand against the enemy on our own. There are alliances. We can't do it. We are no match for them. And so the Bible says, And all of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their wives and their children. Amen. Jehoshaphat, he knew that he has to call upon God. If there's anything we need to do for our families and for our situations, we need to call upon God. Amen. The Bible says, Then uh, Jehaziel, uh, the son of Zechariah, I won't read down through all this, uh, came, and the Spirit of the, Lord, uh, of the Lord in the midst of the congregation, amen, it is God's Spirit, not by our might, not by our power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And He said, Hearken ye, all of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, <coughs> thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it is God's. Amen. Let God fight the battle. Fight it on God's terms. He is the one who goes before us. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they came up by the cliff of Zig, Zig, Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerel. And I'm just going to, well, let's read verse number 17. 
You <coughs> shall uh, you shall not uh, need to fight in this battle. Set yourself, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Sometimes I believe that's what we need to do in life <coughs> is we need to stand still. We are doers. We are goers. We are people who want results. Amen. Stand still and see the salvation of God. So let's talk for a few moments before we dive into what I'm reading, what I've read to us. Get the background. Get what the Lord is speaking to us and bring it to life application for what we need in the hour in which we live. Without a doubt, I would say that we are a generation of <coughs> doers. Would you say you're a doer? You see it. It needs to be done. You want to do it. We believe that something can be done about every aspect of life. I don't want to be real political here, but let's talk about those things that are on the political horizon. You know, we, 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 we think something needs to be done with health care. Let's overhaul it. Let's do it. Something needs to be done. We talk about things that need to be done about illegal immigration. We talk about things that need to be done about terrorist threat. We talk about uh, how the, 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 the drug epidemic is overcoming our society. What can we do to, to uh, uh, rectify that? What can we do to find a solution to that? We are doers. And uh, we look at disease and what can be done to fight against this disease. Uh, well, what can we do? Someone will, 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 will give the plea. Uh, will, will you do something? Somebody do something. And we say we're all doing all that we can. <coughs> it's amazing in the field of medicine how that when there are diseases, people are willing to try anything that, that, that they have on, on the market because we want someone to do something. It's very real. When you're in that situation and you want to see results, you want someone to do something. And uh, so uh, uh, doing something is not necessarily a bad thing because we definitely learn by what we are doing. And thank God for our predecessors who have gone on before us. Thank God for, for research laboratories. Thank God for scientists. Thank God for, 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 for teachers. Thank God for hospitals. Thank God for entrepreneurs. Amen. Thank God for people in the church who are working for pastors and for, for, for Sunday school teachers, for religious educators, because really when everything's all said and done in life, those are the things that's going to matter the most, what we've done for eternity. But we are doers in our society. Let me ask you this question. The word do showing action. Most people are driven by action. Let's get the desired result. Let's feed it. Let's deal with it. Uh, let's, let's work on it. Give enough time, money, and energy. We feel like we can fix anything. But what do we do when the doing is done? What do we do when the doing is done? Let me give you a scenario. I'll bring someone else's name in. Young boy named Corey who has battled cancer. Has battled it where he's seen several hospitals, he's seen several doctors, he's went for opinions, he's went for second opinions. And so he is at the place where the cancer has metastasized and it's metastasized against his intestines, it's metastasized against his internal organs. Even Sister Dietrich, the smell of food nauseates him. He can no longer even think about eating. So nourishment and what he needs to do to get better, to find strength, to get stronger. He's tried all the regimes of medication. They've given him the cocktails. They've, they've, they've worked sometimes. And, but, but, but to no avail, there is nothing that will work for Corey. And so the doctors come into the room and finally uh, they give up trying to restore Corey's health. And his parents look at each other. They say, what do you mean there's no uh, future treatment for my son? There's no surgery. There's no medication. Uh, there's no cure. There's no hope. And so Corey's parents come to the place where they realize that they have fought this mortal battle with everything that was within them. But there's nothing more. I want you to imagine yourself in that situation. I want you to imagine yourself knowing this family. And what would you say to them? There's nothing else that can be done. 
pray, will fast. His parents begin to uh, verbalize that we've done all that we know to do. We've taken them for all types of treatments. We've prayed every prayer that we know to pray. We've come against every demonic attack that we know to come against. Every stronghold. We've cursed darkness. We've cursed disease. We've repented. We've begged. We've pleaded. We've bargained with God. We've taken them to the very best doctors. And what do you do? And all that we can say sometimes is you have done the best that you can do. Recently, I, 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 I sat with a family member who was struggling and battling, and the battle had come to an end for them. And I looked at them in the eye and I said, You did everything you knew to do, and you did it well. We do that in life sometimes, don't we? So, what do we do when the doing is done? I think that's interesting because that's right where the story is. Because. Here is the king, and he is looking for answers. The Bible says that, uh, 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 that the Jehoshaphat, he prays for deliverance, but we find that they're in a very bad place. You see, uh, here it is that the armies of Moab and Ammon and Eden, uh, they had confederated, they had come together, and they're going to fight against Judah. And here's Jehoshaphat, and he realizes that individually he could overcome and conquer each one of these, these armies, but as they've allied together, they are just too large and their resources are too strong. There is just no way that Judah, uh, their military forces, can fight. So King Jehoshaphat, he realizes that, that these bloodthirsty men, it's going to be a massacre. What can we do? We've done all that we know to do. What can we do? And so you know what Jehoshaphat does? He's weak and he's paralyzed by fear. And so he calls together a national day of prayer and fasting. And he says, everyone, I want you to gather in. So they flocked to, uh, into Judah from Jerusalem, and, uh, to Jerusalem, to the temple. And there Jehoshaphat, he took a position in the courtyard and he led them in prayer and he led them in praise. And he began to recount all the things that God had done for them. How that he had driven their enemies out of the land in, in previous times. And, and God, when we call for you, you've been there. But now Moab and, and, and Ammon and, and Edom, uh, they, they all allied against us. God, you told us that when we came out of Egypt, you, you told us but not to invade these territories. And, and now this is the way that you're repaying us. They're going to take away our inheritance. See, sometimes spiritually we feel that way. We feel like, God, I've done everything that I can do. God is not looking for us to fight the battle on our own resources. God doesn't want us to conquer carnality on our own. God doesn't want us to fight the enemy on our own. God doesn't want us to go through any of life's struggles on our own. It's time that we reflect and we recount all the times that God has worked and moved for us. And as we do that, I do believe that God will work and move because the Bible says that as a Jehoshaphat, he, he, he recounted everything and he says, God, we don't know what to do. And there's a hush that silences all the people. And all of a sudden, we find that... Uh, the, 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 the priest steps up and he says, wait a second, don't be intimidated for by this vast army because the battle is not yours, it's God's. <laughs> Listen, my friend, I need to tell you something, that when you've committed your life to the work of this cross, amen, and you've allowed the atoning work of Jesus Christ to be very real in your life, you confess your sins by the blood of Jesus Christ, amen, uh, that, that old man He's dead and now you're resurrected in newness of life. You need to be reminded that the battle is not yours. Amen. The battle's God's. Amen. Let Him fight the battle for you. Amen. You see, the priest, Jehazel, begins to say, I want you to take your firm position and see the deliverance that God's going to keep you. The people, they were Relieved and in awe that their 
knees they sank to worship. Their stress subsided. Their fears were gone. It turned to joy. It turned to confidence. When they realized that it wasn't Ammon, it wasn't Moab, it wasn't Eden, Eden that was in control. It was God who was in control. So the next day, Brother Eli, they set out to find these armies. Brother David, these armies among themselves began to squabble. But while they began to fight, they did each other, man. And the Lord allowed His people to have the victory. You see, Jehoshaphat didn't give them weapons. He didn't give them anything to relinquish them because he knew that this battle would be like a lamb against a lion. And so there was nothing that could be done. He took his chief position where God wanted him to be by putting his confidence and his trust in God. But so I want to ask you something. At this very first Sunday of 2018, there are desires that each one of us want to see accomplished for the kingdom of God. There may be battles that you face. There may be things where you'll say, I've done all that I can do. It's time to allow God now. Amen. It's a time to, to allow yourself to rise up in the confidence that God is fighting the battle for you and the outcomes belong to God. Amen. I know that in our generation we are doers and our mind is set up on doing and accomplishing with the resources that we have. But God's not looking for your resources because He created everything that you can grab your hands hold, uh, hold up, everything that you can put your mind to. God's already created Amen. So why don't you trust the Creator who has more resources than you and I will ever have, even if we ally ourselves together. So let's be done and let's trust in God. See, God despised Moab because they were a heathen nation. He called them a wash pot. He called them a place that, wow, that's a place where you can go and wash your feet, Sister Alice. I don't think I want God to look at me and say that. He's a wash pot. Go wash your feet, man. I want to be more like Job. Have you considered my servant, Job? But the Bible says, this is interesting, that that place called Moab, that one day that there was a famine in Bethlehem, Judah, by day. And there was a lady by the name of Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two sons, Malon and Kilion, who because there was a famine in the land, Brother Dennis went down into Moab. And they thought, this is our time that while there's a famine in the land, that we will go down and we will get us a little nest egg. And we will get everything that we can. And when famine is over, we'll come home and we'll have a little nest egg and things will be better. But we find that that wasn't the situation, Daniel. Naomi went down there and her life seemed to be good. She gave two daughter-in-laws. You know the story well. We know what happens. That in that land, she buries her, her three men, her husband and her two uh, uh, sons. And so she really doesn't have a great attachment to her daughter-in-laws. It's not like their family, like, like she would like for them to be. She encourages them to stay. We know the story. Uh, Ruth said, but I am going to accompany you. Listen, I, there's something that Ruth saw in this family and their God that when she had nothing, she knew that they had something great. And so the Bible says that Ruth comes back with her mother-in-law. Listen, she had done nothing wrong that her husband died. She had done nothing wrong that she has to leave uh, her homeland as she is poor. She's come to this country and she's not treated well. She's done everything she knows to do. She's right. But she learns the Jewish law of the land, Sister Dietrich, that she can go out to where they're gleaning in the field. And the Jewish law says that they're not to glean around the edge of the field, Sister Jenny. And so that is where the widows and the poor folks can come and get their food. And so she's done nothing wrong. She's doing her best. She goes out every day and she begins to glean. She catches the eye of Boaz. Boaz sees her, although he's older than her. He looks and 
He sees the type of lady that she is. She, she, he sees her character, what she's doing for her mother-in-law, the way she works, and her faithfulness. And so we know how the story goes. The story goes that all of a sudden, Boaz says, he says to Ruth, I don't want you gleaning anywhere else but in my fields. Brother Eli, this is where Boaz wants her strictly, and this is where he wants her to stay. She comes home, and, she, and, 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 and Naomi says, man, you're blessed, you're blessed. Talk begins to happen, and they realize that Boaz is a near kinsman to Elimelech, which could redeem Ruth. So Ruth realizes that she's been faithful, that she's found favor in the sight of, of Boaz. And so her and Naomi begin to talk together. And they say this. Listen to me. Don't lose me here because I have some things I want to say to you. Naomi says, Ruth, I want you to bath. Bathe in this very fragrant bath. And this is what you need to robe yourself on. Boaz is out. And he is camping about round about where his harvest is to protect it and watch over it. I want you to go by night and I want you to uncover his feet. I want you to begin to show him that you're open to him being the near kinsman redeemer. Sister Alice, this is the thing. But Ruth says, but what if he doesn't want me? What if this all backfires? The bottom line is this, is that Ruth did everything she knew to do, and then she had to leave the rest of it to God. God, you work on Boaz's heart. You bring the end results. Well, you see, yes, Ruth may have been beautiful, but maybe there was diligence. Definitely caught his eye. Her loyalty to Naomi. And so all of a sudden, Ruth says, I have to lay aside everything else and I have to trust to see what the outcome will be. Boaz will have to do the rest. Because I can't do anything more. I told you about Corey, the young man that there was nothing left to do. God, you gotta do the rest. I told you about Jehoshaphat. Judah's army just wasn't big enough, so what will they do? I've done all that I can do, so God. And then we just looked at Ruth. And Ruth said, I've done all that I can do. But what are the outcomes? True story I read about Corey. I don't know him, but I read about him. Do you know that Corey wound up dying. But in his death, he lifted his hands to God and said, God, I trust you with eternity. Corey didn't lose. Corey didn't lose. His mom and dad had done their best. He had done his best. You know, Jehoshaphat said, God, I worship you. This is all I know to do. I've done everything I know to do. I've followed your commands. And God said, it's time for you to be done. It's a time to allow me. We know the story about Ruth. We just passed by Christmas. Do you know when you look back at the lineage of Jesus Christ, you will find that Ruth is in the lineage of Jesus Christ because she was faithful. She done everything she knew to do. But Brother Wally, she couldn't change the heart of Boaz. She couldn't make herself be his wife. She couldn't say, will you please be my dear kinsman redeemer. The rest had to be left up to Boaz and to God for the rest to be done. You know, we have to allow God to take care of what we cannot do. I've done the best that I can do. God, I'm giving you everything. Listen, uh, that's when we get to that place in life, amen, you don't need to feel guilty that you needed to do more. What you need to feel focused on is that you are trusting God with your life and this situation. 
as we are in the commencement of 2018. I don't know what may be ahead for you, but what I can tell you is I know that you are probably much like me. You're probably a doer, but it's time that you let the doing be done and you allow God to work and move because God can do far more than what you and I can do. Amen. Amen. God, what are you going to do? Listen, health issues. The woman with the issue of blood, you read her story. The Bible says that she went to the doctors and she spent everything. She did all she knew to do. But one day Jesus passed by and she said, I've done all that I can do. So God, now I give it to you. So if you have to have health issues, I'm not telling you not to do anything. I'm saying that when you've done all that you can do, amen, trust Jesus. Amen. He's able to fix it. He's able to minister. He is the great physician. Amen. Uh, when we think about praying for our loved ones, you may say, Brother Seville, I have prayed and prayed and prayed for my loved one, and I don't know what else to do. Think about this. The prodigal son left home on Luke chapter number 15. He left home. His daddy gave him his inheritance. He wasted his money on riotous living. Do you not think daddy did not want his boy home with him? I believe every day he thought about him. That's how parents work. Those other parents, you know that. But sometimes you just got to say, God, I trust. I trust you. Do you not think that prodigal son's dad did not pray for him? And one day, daddy saw him a long way off walking down the road. And the word of God says that he ran and met him. God did it. Your husband not saved, your wife not saved, your children not saved, family members that it encompasses your mind and you desire for them to be saved. You give the word. When God opens the door, you get it. But you allow God to work in your life. When the doing is done, God will finish and do the work. How about allowing God to fight our battles? David knew all about that. Gideon knew about that. Samson knew about that. Moses knew about that. Noah knew about that. Read all those in Hebrews chapter number 11. When the doing is done, we'll trust God. I shared this with you already, but I want to finish with this. In the past couple of weeks, in my own reading of the Word of God, it became so clear to me that in the book of Job, that first book that was written, we read, we analyze, and it does become a place where we say, why does God's people suffer? Why do people that love God go through hard times, loss, sickness, whatever? But I don't think that was the purpose of the book. Because from the very beginning, when Satan came, and he appeared from walking to and to on the earth, God brought up to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? God brought it up. Because God was not looking at a reason why people would go through suffering and difficulty. But God was saying, let me set the precedence that sanctification is important. Habits, carnality, worldliness, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, will only be conquered when we say, God, I'm done doing it. I need you to work in And we allow the power of the Holy Ghost to move in us. Listen, being a Christian is not just saying, oh, I go to church. But again, until we confess our sins, the darkness, 
the hatredness of it, the blackness of it, that God despises because it admires the wholeness of God. Until we say, God save me, deliver me, forgive me of my sins. I'm guilty and I confess them before you. And we accept the toning work of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, that is salvation. But we are not done at salvation. 